Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Aisha Tyler. The Tron Call Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz, Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Hello and welcome to the TalkHouse Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. This week's episode features a pair of legends from the alt-country or country or no depression or Americana or whatever you want to call it worlds. You pick. It's Jay Farrar of Sunvolt, along with singer-songwriter and many other things, Steve Earle. Jay Farrar started his career as part of the seminal band Uncle Tupelo alongside another noted songwriter and frequent TalkHouse guest, Jeff Tweedy. After their split, Tweedy went on to form Wilco, while Farrar formed Sunvolt, which has since released an impressive catalog. Their 10th and latest album was recorded during pandemic downtime, and you can hear it in the deliberateness of the songs. It's called Electro Melodier, and here's a little taste of the song Reverie. When you fade into Steve Earle is one of those guys who makes you feel lazy. He's not only an incredibly accomplished singer and songwriter with literally dozens of albums to his credit, he's also a producer, an actor, most notably on The Wire, a novelist, a serious XM DJ, and as you'll hear here, an aspiring TV show creator. His 2020 album, Ghosts of West Virginia, was spun off from an off-Broadway show he worked on, while this year's JT is a tribute to his talented son, Justin Towns Earle, who passed away just last year. As you'll hear... He's got even more projects in the works, including a tribute to singer-songwriter Jerry Jeff Walker. Here's a little bit of Union, God, and Country from 2020's Ghosts of West Virginia. My dad was a miner, my daddy's daddy too. Union, God, and Country was all they ever knew. They worked from early morning till the evening was so blue. When they strike the mine, they walk the line, cause that's just what you do. Born in West Virginia, a minor through and through. Union God and country was all you ever knew. As you'll hear, Steve Earl loves to chat while Jay Farrar is a bit more subdued, a fact that these friends acknowledge right off the bat. But they get into a great conversation about their favorite subject, music, what they listened to growing up, the great shows that Earl saw as a kid, and even the time Earl sold some weed to Leslie West of Mountain. Steve talks about missing the whole genesis of alt-country for good reason. He was in jail, but catching up with it, and with Sunvolt in particular. Enjoy. Good to see you, man. It's been a while. Last time we saw each other, you were gracious enough to loan me three of your harmonicas. (laughs) And you have to know somebody real well to borrow or lend a harmonica. It's it's one of those things. It's an unsanitary instrument. It's like sharing a toothbrush. You know, our musical bond has been forged now. I know no doubt about it. I I occasionally, like when I'm playing small places on a solo tour or something, I play adult nightclubs where people eat sometimes, you know, and I apologize to the whole front row. For anything that comes flying out of the heart, you know, while they're eating, because it can happen. There can be particles. It's just one of those things. You do your best, but it's an unsanitary instrument. I guess background-wise, the way we met, I missed Uncle Tupelo entirely, because that was that period of time when I was, I was like, didn't even have a guitar, and I was on the street, and then I was locked up. And so by the time I got out of jail, got clean, you know, and started plugging myself back in. I'd heard there was an Uncle Tupelo and that there was getting ready to be Sunbelt and Wilco. The records weren't out yet. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of other people missed it too. So uh, part of the club. Yeah. But dude, I always knew who the Burrito Brothers were. I, I got lucky because of where I lived. The Burritos got played on the radio. Oh, man. You know, country rock was a thing to me from Jump Street. I mean, a part of it's where I grew up, yeah. you know, and Buck Owens and the Beatles were played on the same radio station where I grew up. Is that AM or FM? Yeah. Well, AM. Yeah, it yep. would have been all AM radio at that point. FM radio starts about the time I'm like uh, in junior high school, the first FM station in San Antonio. Yeah. And that and AM is where I heard Beatles and Buck Owens on the same station. FM is where I heard the Flying Burrito Brothers for the first time. And that was the local, what do they call it, progressive radio station, which actually it, it began... And that was in Houston area or... San, San Antonio. San Antonio. San Antonio. Okay. That, that's actually where I grew up. 
you know, so I got lucky. I heard the Burrito Brothers. I heard those Birds records. You know, I, I knew about that yeah. stuff. I think it does have to do with where you grew up. Yeah, with, for me, it, you know, it would have been Kansas and J.D. Blackfoot and stuff like that. Right, right. But the AM, AM radio was still pretty good. With They could play Badfinger and they would play you know, Neil Young and stuff like that. Yeah, so. uh, yeah. The, the stuff that was on FM radio, the stuff that became the hits got played on AM radio, too. They they played the edited version of Inagata De Vida. You know? <laughs> what kind of rock bands did you go out to see when you were a teenager? I was lucky because San Antonio was one of those places where – all these tours came through and there were three or four bands on a tour. So I saw humble pie three or four times. The bands that were on the middle of the bill, you got to see a lot. Yeah. I saw humble pie a lot. I saw the original Fleetwood Mac a lot. I saw Savoy Brown a lot. I saw wishbone ash. I saw Leslie West, a bag of pot through the back door of the municipal auditorium in San Antonio when I was 15 years old. So I listened to rock and roll. Not many people can say that. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. And we had a conversation about that at Matt Umanoff's guitars years later. Cause uh, you know, he, uh, uh, until he passed away, he would pot. I loved mountain. I loved that band. And I've recently sort of revisited that sort of a chain of events. Like I moved to New York and then I had a house in Woodstock for a while until this last divorce, it kind of went away in that. And, but my neighbors were John Sebastian and, you know, live on Helm, John mm. Henry's one of a handful of kids that, that can say he got his first drum kit from Levi Helm for Christmas, you know? Damn, yeah. But Sebastian was a big deal to me when I was a kid. And so I hung out with him and he came to my house and played my guitars and collected vicariously through me because Catherine had put her foot down and wouldn't let him have any more guitars in the house. And I, I kept buying them. And I always knew Felix Papillardi was important, but, but Papillardi who produced not only those mountain records, he was the bass player and, and one of the singers in mountain, and wrote a lot of that stuff, but he also produced the first two cream records. You know, he, he was, he was a really important guy around music in New York and they were really, really close friends. And so I just sort of recently because of that kind of lined up and I got out those first two mountain records or I downloaded them, put them on my phone a couple of Christmases ago and wrote around and listened to them. Um, yeah. My, uh, the mountain section of my record collection is, is nil. They're worth checking out, but I get up. My dad just would not let me have an electric guitar. And, and that I became a folky by default. I sang in a few rock bands, but you kind of had to own a PA system to get that gig in a high school yeah. rock band. The guy that owned the PA got to be the singer. And um, I did it in a couple of bands. I, you know, uh, I played bass in one. I just, but I didn't really have that equipment either. My dad wouldn't let me have an electric guitar, not because he hated electric guitar, because there were five kids and, and there just and there wasn't money and there wasn't room yeah. and space for the sound. So I had an acoustic guitar, so I started gravitating towards stuff that sounded like my guitar. So I was listening to the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks, but I I learned to play Mother's Little Helper and a well respected man and you know Rocky Raccoon and oh, yeah. you know, stuff that sounded like my guitar. The kinks, you know, one thing we could talk about is probably the Stones. I think I I saw that you mentioned one time that your favorite period of songs you're most influenced by was the mid 60s like those mid 60s albums absolutely yeah for me i kind of run with the crowd you know like 1968 beggar's banquet through 1976 well beggar's banquet is one of my records i mean it's like beggar's banquet let it bleed and it doesn't end there i love the riff rock stones too yeah. but so the acoustic guitars and you know to listen to, to hear the acoustic stuff and the later stuff it was the one or two keith tracks where you heard a lot of acoustic guitars earlier on acoustics were much more prominent and yeah. i could make my guitar sound like that i just gravitated towards what i could emulate you know sure yeah keith yeah i learned to play from records you know i learned from my uncle for a few years who was five years older than me that lived in our house when he was a senior in high school for a year gave me my first guitar and gave me some bad stuff too I mean by bad stuff <laughs> Like drugs, and, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Synthesizer? Yeah, yeah. No, no, not synthesizer. I don't have an aversion to any instrument in the right hands uh, when it gets right down to it. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, there's a lot of synthesizers on my records in the 80s, man. I just used them a little differently than some people did. The bagpipe on the front of Copperhead Road is a Rhodes Chroma patch that my keyboard player built from scratch. And it's well, pretty convincing, actually. No, they're they're useful instruments now. I, I just say that because they, they, if they get in the wrong hands. <laughs> yeah, I think there's two ways to do it. Use it as a utility thing. And also, there's been some stuff that's just unapologetic synthesizer music that was just 
you know, by very smart people that I thought was kind of cool, too. I'm lucky I don't have any real prejudices about a particular kind of music. I just sort of I think it's about songs. Yeah. I think that's the songs that stick with everybody. I I always wondered about that with that wave. There's always been they changed the name of it. It said it was country rock. I'm okay with that term. I never in Austin, they were saying progressive country. There was a radio station with, with the call letters K-O-K-E that played progressive country in the 70s. And K-O-K-E. Nice. Yeah, K-O-K-E. Yeah, it was a thing in Austin. But uh, turquoise and cocaine, those were the two minerals. But by the time I got out of jail and heard about you guys, everybody was talking about alt country. Mm-hmm. And now they're calling it Americana. Yeah, you you probably heard the labels recycled. Over a few more times than I have, but uh, but that well, that's just because I mean, there's eight tracks on my first record. That's just because I'm old, you know. It's one of those <laughs> things. I've seen the I've seen a whole format CDs come and then go away, you yeah. know, just because I didn't die. That's just kind of basically it. That's so, that's the way we do it. Yeah, yeah. So, but I wondered about you guys, like what there was something going on in the Midwest, you know, where you grew up, mm-hmm. and a little earlier than you, like in the '80s, when I had a country music deal, which was kind of a separate thing, but the, some of the same guys that were listening to the Long Riders and bands like that were going on the West Coast. And the Long Riders got identified with sort of a neo-psychedelic movement, but they were a country rock band and a good one, you know, a really yeah. good one. So what were, what were you listening to that made you that want to do something that that was, you know, heavily, heavily influenced by, by country music and folk music? I mean, I got most of those influences from both of my parents. You know, my father was, he played guitar and he played Hank Williams songs, you know, that was right. something that resonated. And my mom was uh, more into the uh, the folk side of things. She knew the Dillards. Uh, you know, both of my folks came from the Ozarks. So, um, you know, the Dillards were kind of big in their world. Wow. And uh, wow. You know, she knew Rodney and Doug Dillard. So those records were, were around the house. So you were hearing bluegrass as well when you were growing up to some degree. Yeah. I remember being on a bus in St. Louis and you came to the show. You know, I told you that I was going to make a bluegrass record. I don't think you believed me. And you got done and I played you the first four tracks from the mountain. And you said, you, you did it. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> seemed some, genuinely surprised because I made it with the Del McCurry band. You know, I just, yeah. Doug Dillard was one of the very, who was in Nashville when I got there, you know, it was just him by that time. And he hung around at the station and he's one of the very first people I met. And he just, for some reason, long before I made a record or anybody recorded with my songs, he sort of liked me and would talk to me and was a huge oh, help. Nice. And the Dillards are a big deal to me. Those records are amazing. There's part of the continuum right there, I guess. Doug yeah. Dillard so brings us brings us together. But uh, where, where was the first time that we met? Was it actually just doing a show together? I think maybe we were on the same bill at like, what was that 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 place in Nashville? Something so it was a number. I think that was the very first one. It was the first time I got up and did Windfall with you guys. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we started doing it in our encores, you know. So that, I think that was the first time. Yep. And um, I, I found out. I know how I found out about you guys. I worked with Richard Dodd on on I Feel All Right on four of those tracks. Richard produced and. There was some kind of weird thing going on where I don't remember what it was because he was involved with the Wilco record too, but he was involved peripherally with your record because it was he wasn't supposed to be. His engineer basically had mixed it. So they were working on it there. When I came in to start work on those four tracks, there were I feel all right was done in pieces. We started it before I had a record deal. Ray Kennedy and I did, and Richard Bennett did three or four tracks. And then, and then Richard Dodd did four tracks. And then we went back and finished it with Richard Bennett and, and Ray Kennedy at race place. And I ended up owning part of that studio. I'm working with Ray Kennedy for years and still do to this day, but um, I don't have the studio anymore because I moved to New York. That sort of leads to a Lucinda question, I guess you were the producer of car wheels, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I was. And, and it was it, in those days, Ray was been my engineer all that time. And we've, we sort of produced everything under, you know, producer engineer. Even my brother was considered to be a member because he was our second there, uh, Patrick, but um, we called it twang trust. And my manager still pissed off at me because a lot of people don't know I produced that record because the credit is, tra- is twang trust. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. it, it's um, we were making, I feel all right. And I've done loop since we were, teenagers you know so she had settled in nashville by that time the first time i wrote a duet specifically for us to sing called you're still standing there i'd come become fascinated with duets and i started writing songs to be duets so lou came in to record 
you know, that song with me. And she just liked the way her voice sounded in our studio. So she had already recorded one version of Car Wheels and neither she or the label were happy with it. And so we started all over again and re-recorded all of that stuff. And um, it was tumultuous. It was like I ended up overseeing a divorce between her and, you know, not they yeah. weren't married, but they were married musically. You know, right. And it was just um, it was one of those things that uh, I got was in the middle of. I'm with, really proud to have been part of it. With your your guiding hand, you know, you made a great record there. Well, it, it was one of those things. All we ever did there was just try not to get in the way. We had a way yeah. that things sounded. That's that's the essence of it all, you know. If, if you yeah, it's just, about uh, songs. And she had a great band. We used her band. John Shambody was still with us in those days. He played bass, and he was her manager at the time. But, you know, Shambody was, uh, I used him on sessions in L.A. when I lived there for a short period of time and a couple of things. Shambody was in Clover, that country rock band that Huey Lewis had, who ended up being the record on My Aim is True, the first Elvis Costello record. Oh. That's Shambody Did on not all know those that. songs. And yeah. And uh, and then Donald, her drummer, was a, who passed away, he's gone now too, was a great drummer. And then Gerf Morlix had, had been her right hand and and, yeah. and guitar player for a long time. And that he's on Car Wheels. Uh, he got taken off a lot of it after it left my hands. Mm -hmm. But uh, other people worked on it and it came back to Ray. We ended up restoring it to pretty much what Ray and I originally recorded before it actually came out. It was went through a couple of record labels and it was just uh, Danny Goldberg ended up buying it you know from american recordings and when he was hmm. he brought it over to another label and, and put it out that's um and by that time i'd started working with danny too so that's how danny found out about me really was was working on the lucinda record that's how he kind of got how i kind of got his and he's still my manager to this day so i was i was part of that as well yep. yeah yeah, yeah. No, i remember that yep. that's where the joe McEwen, that's <laughs> where the joe McEwen meeting took place that was an art of us <laughs> it was pretty funny when i tell people that story that no you and no Joe, their, their jaws drop. <laughs> Just the, the whole image of me sitting there. So I said, boy, you must have been talking a lot. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> and I, I, I said, well, I talk a lot. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those deals. Yeah, Joe's a great guy, though. You know, it's funny. I went back to Warner for one record. Cameron Strang was, you know, was running Warner and he signed me there and then they fired him and then it, they dropped me. The same old record company dance. Yes. Yeah, it's one of those. Deal it's weirder than it's ever been. I don't know what to tell people. Even by the time Justin came along, I didn't know what to tell him about the music business. It had changed so much by then. Now we're in this point where masters are actually worth more than copyrights are now jay and that's something that i really believed i would never see hmm. and it, and it's because of streaming when you see all yeah. these big deals they're trying to buy everything they they want to buy I, i'm selling everything up to now just because they're paying a lot of money for it now odds are they won't be paying this much bef between the in the time i've got left on the planet and i'm right. definitely getting more than i'll collect in royalties gotcha. yeah, yeah. It, you know just waiting for it to come in and i can set john henry up my youngest son's 11 and he has autism so his brother ian will take care of him but and his kids probably will too but but ian has two kids of his own so he needs resources to take up the slack because John Henry's going to need a lot of taking care of. So sure, sure. it's a, uh, he, he's, you know, he communicates, he does not speak though. And he's probably not going to be able to work and make a living. And then at the list of points, I mean, anything can happen, but so far that's our guess, you know, so this will allow me to set things up and, you know, it's one, and I want to stay in New York because the next chapter for me is music for theater. That's what I've been doing. So, yeah, you, so you're, you actually have done some uh, some Broadway. I mean, you've worn a lot of different hats over the years. You know, you've you're six. Haven't done Broadway <laughs> yet, but I've done a couple of plays with music off Broadway things, and I'm working on a, something that's tracked for Broadway right now, which is it's a musical of of Tender Mercies, which I, I don't know whether you recall that movie. That sounds familiar. It was Robert Duvall, and it was uh, oh yeah yeah yeah. It was Bruce Beresford's first film, and it's uh, set in Central Texas. It's about this kind of washed up country songwriter and singer and his songs made his wife famous and he's kind of been on the skids and he pops up in this 
this little tiny at this little tiny motel in central Texas. And this woman takes him in and he gets sober. And then his ex-wife comes through town on a tour and, and things get interesting. And, and um, I, it's just perfect for me. Horton Foote wrote the screenplay, who also wrote The Trip to Bountiful. And um, he wrote uh, the screen adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird. That's what put him on the map. And he um, oh, gotcha. he just uh, he's a great writer. He's gone now. But his daughter, Daisy Foote, has been trying to put together something for a musical for years. And I was in a show called Coal Country that was up at the public theater that I was actually performing in. I wrote the songs for it's about an explosion that happened in a coal mine in West Virginia, like yeah. 11, almost 12 yeah. years ago. Yeah, I remember you talking about that. Yeah, that record became good of West Virginia, which is the record I put out in the middle of the pandemic. So I have a record to tour next summer. I'm going to make a, a final tribute record. I'm going to complete the set. I probably would have done, if Justin hadn't passed away, I probably would have already done this, but I'm, I'm going to complete the set. Guy Towns, I'm going to make a record of Jerry Jeff Walker songs. And All right. yeah. we're going to record that in December and it'll come out this summer because theater takes a long time. So I'm going to be work concentrating the songwriting on Cold Country for a little while yet to go before we get that show up. Gotcha. Let's go through the list of the, all the different hats you've worn over the years. You know, so you're obviously singer, songwriter, musician. You've written novels too, right? One novel and a collection of short fiction I've published, and I'm working on another novel. So obviously, actor. Yeah, and that was just David's. That's David Simon's idea, yeah. and you know, the idea was I was supposed to play a redneck recovering addict, and I didn't feel like I would have to act, so <laughs> I, I took it, and and I loved David Simon, you know, so I did it. He's a big music fan, so he knew about me. One of my songs had been the theme of a prior project of his called The Corner, and you're still a DJ, right? You, you do that? Yeah, I did that. I've been the, that's I part. I've had that show. I, well, I started on Air America, and I had a show on Air America. Yeah. I, I remember that. That was uh, I showed up for that one time when you, yeah, you and Chuck, Chuck yes, C had a show. <laughs> that blew my mind that you guys had that show. That was incredible. Yeah, no, we and Chuck D, we had the two music shows, and we would get together every once in a while because he was on the panel of one of the political shows as well every day. But he he had a musical show, and I had a musical show. Mine was mainly about just interviewing people that you know mostly, and it, I gravitated towards doing more about write songs and songwriting. And then by the time Air America ended, Sirius had been making offers for a long time, so I went to Sirius, and I've been there ever since. So you got Broadway's in the works, and. Uh... So what's left? You know, you're going to fly to space with with uh, Bezos? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. That, that. Everybody, everybody's doing that shit. You know, it's, it's, it's like, I, oh, I'll tell you what I'm working on. This closest I'm going to come to, I'm going to time travel. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I'm, I'm working on a pilot for a TV show. It started out as a treatment I wrote. I just got the idea from uh, uh, there's another I, I, I'm not going to really talk about right now. There's a TV show based on something else I wrote in the past that is probably going to get made and I'll be a producer on it, but it's not really me writing it. But it got me mm -hmm. interested in the process. And I've been around it a lot. I worked with David Simon right. and I've been in, in a couple of shows and I've been in movies. I think the best dramatic writing being done today is arguably being done for television. It's just it's where the money is. The writers control like theater is a brilliant actor's medium. Film is a director's medium. And the producers in the in the TV world are writers. That's that's who runs every the showrunners are writers. They come from writing. And I just I got this idea and I wrote a treatment. And Brian Koppelman, who's been really successful with billions and some other stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's a big oh, music yeah. fan and, and we have friends in common. His father actually was a publisher and his father bought me once, I remember years ago. <laughs> so to speak. Gotcha. <laughs> well, I was well, bought me when I was a young boy, but uh <laughs> I just showed it to him and he called me back and he was in the middle of trying to get this last season of billions up. So they were, they right. were, you know, up to their ass and alligators, just trying to get it all done and the coming out of COVID. And he said, this is really good. If you want to get on a zoom, you know, and, and I did with him and his partner. And we talked about it a couple of different times, a couple of different zoom meetings. And he just finally told me, he said, do not let your agent pitch. This as a treatment. You need to write the pilot or it will get taken away from you. Right. So just go through the process of writing the pilot and then show it to me. So I'm, you know, and who knows, he's just helping me do it. He gave me a free copy of Final Draft and I'm about halfway through it. And it's about um, 
It's a time travel thing set in Marfa, Texas. It's called Marfa Lights. Huh. And it's, it's, you know, sort of based on the idea that if a time traveler or an alien showed up in Marfa, it would take people a while to notice. That's, that's one premise of it. <laughs> I've never, uh, never been there, but, it, you know, there's, there's festivals and music festival there, right? I've got so many friends that are connected to it kind of semi. Terry Allen's one of my oldest, dearest friends. And he's, Terry, you know, people know him as, you know, kind of part of that West Texas songwriter thing. He wrote New yeah. Delhi Freight Train that Little Feet did. He's made those great records like Juarez. But his day job is he's a visual artist. He paints and draws, but mainly he does bronze sculpture for the last several decades. And he's really great. He did. He went through a period where he and David Byrne were doing these collaborations that were big environmental sculptures that were wired for sound. And, and Byrne yeah. did, the, did most of the music and, and Terry did the visual part. I started painting because of Terry, right after I got out of jail. He and Guy Clark were best friends. and Oh, gotcha. Okay. They used to have a duo called, you know, well, all those guys, Joe Ely, uh, all the West Texas guys, Ely, Butch Hancock, all mm-hmm. those guys. They Terry, they all went to the same high school. Terry was older than them, and he went away to L.A. to go to art school when he graduated. Yeah, and the rest of them. And came yeah. back and forth, and he was a big influence on those guys. He's sort of the ringleader of that whole West Texas school. Yeah. Uh, how about Jerry Jeff Walker? Maybe we should uh, switch over because I only have a peripheral, you know, exposure to his stuff. And you said you have a new project in the works. Yeah. And, and one of the things I want to do is I've already recorded the Guy Clark songs, which are some of the songs he's best known for because he he put Guy on the map because over two albums, he recorded three Guy Clark songs that are the, the best known Guy songs. But people, a lot of people associate them with Jerry Jeff. Desperado is waiting for a train, L.A. Freeway. And old time feeling. And I've already recorded those songs because I did a record of guy songs, you know, a while back. Right, right, right. So those aren't going to, I decided that since those are out of the way, I'll concentrate on songs that Jerry Jeff wrote. And there's lots of stuff that go back to 1968. I mean, I'm obviously doing Mr. Bojangles. I'm doing a song called I Makes Money, But It Don't Make Me, which is him and him and Dave Bromberg, you know, were a great duo. And, yeah. and it's, you know, he was a folky. He was like part of that second wave in the late 60s. He was kind of a him. Uh, he, uh, said Ke- uh, Keith Sykes, Emmy Lou Harris, Gary B. White, a bunch of folks lived over here on Thompson Street, about two blocks from where I am right now. And he was part of the National Coffee House circuit, and he was successful in that. And he's the reason that we know who Jimmy Buffett is. Buffett was from Alabama, and he was writing for Billboard in Nashville, and he interviewed Jerry Jeff, and hmm. which started a chain of events that ended up his wife kicking him out. So he came down to Florida to play a gig after Jerry Jeff went down to Coconut <laughs> Grove, and he was a week early for his own gig, so he called Jerry Jeff. And Jerry Jeff drove him to Key West and Buffett stayed. And that's how the whole uh-huh. Buffett, Florida, Caribbean thing got started. That's Jerry Jeff's fault, too. He, he, <laughs> he was he was hugely influential. I was lucky that I knew him before I even got to Nashville. And he would champion people. He would tell, you know, he's the reason we know about a lot of people. We did a memorial for him in Lukenbach. Yeah, the, Susan did get to have a funeral when he passed away because it was in the middle of, of all everything being locked down. Yeah. Um, but me, Emmy, Buffett, Jeff Hanna, because the Dirt Man had the big hit on on, on Mr. Bojangles, and um, mm-hmm. yeah, there was a lot of folks on the thing, and um, yeah, Pat Green, and, and uh, of course Jerry Jeff's son Django, and we sang a bunch of Jerry Jeff Walker songs and and Lickenbach. So we're we're going to record it in December. I think you'll hear some songs you've never heard before if you don't know those early records, the Atco records and the Vanguard records. Those were yeah, yeah, I don't. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, there's some really good ones in there, and we got some. We're recording some of the other stuff, and there's going to be some like the main part of the record, which will be ten songs. I've I've gone back to ten songs because I I, I make my records for vinyl. Because mm-hmm. it's such a small thing that... Yeah, you know, I'm starting to think the same way. I sequence them and, and write them for vinyl. And if I have to have bonus tracks, I put I make those separately. I'll save one for Record Store Day because I like to support that. I like to have mm-hmm. a single for Record Store Day every year. So we're probably going to record three other songs that he's known for that he didn't necessarily write. One of them is just, I think, is a great song that I learned from him, which is called Night Rider's Lament. It's on a record called Ride and Hide that's after all those... Viva Trilingua and all those records that were that kind of put him on the map for good in the 70s. But a guy in from Alaska showed up named Mike Burton, showed up in Austin and played around town for a couple of years and then decided he didn't like the lower 48 all that much. He went back to Alaska and I never heard from him again. But uh, he wrote this incredible song called Night Rider's Lament. 
And uh, actually, a lot of people think Chris Ledoux wrote it because Ledoux learned it from the Jerry Jeff record, and he recorded it. And that whole cowboy music world, you know, out west where there's, yeah. you know, you know, rodeos and literally it's cowboy, real, real cowboys, cowboys stuff. listening to yeah. this stuff. It, it, they know the song is a Chris Ledoux record. So I'm going to record that, I think, for a bonus track. And I think just um, just because I love um, Ray Hubbard so much, and people will expect it as a bonus track. We'll probably do Redneck Mother, although I'm a little <laughs> conflicted about it. Um, for one thing, the, you know, Ray Hubbard's so much more than that. He plays it every night. He's grateful for it, but he's right, right, right. Ray Hubbard's a great fucking performer and writes great songs. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so I'm going to come great. up with a new with a new M O T H E R. I've been working on that that'll make it worth the trip and and worth the price of admission. No, I'll, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. And I uh, I think uh, you know we'll see what happens. But I'm. It's going to be called Jerry Jeff, and we're going to record it in December. It should be out in time for us to sell them off the stage when we hit the. I only do three months, you know. Now I do the I do the cruise and a few gigs here and there, but yeah. As far as actually touring, I go from Memorial Day to Labor Day just so I can keep John Henry in school here for for nine months. Sure, we're just kind of been on on standby. You know, we've done a couple of shows the last couple of months or a couple of months worth of shows, but uh, yeah, with with the pandemic, everything just kind of gets pushed back and pushed back. So we're we're just kind of waiting for next year and hopefully we carried over shows from the summer before and last summer that like we had some that that we couldn't we only we didn't get started till july 1st last summer so that that meant we didn't get west of the rockies so we want to make sure we do that i'm not going to get to europe i'm used to seeing paris every 18 or 19 months man and i'm starting to freak out a little bit about that they're not ready to do anything yet and when they get ready to Summer, we're we're trying to plan really hard for a European tour summer after this coming one. Right. We're concentrating on making sure we get to, we'll, we'll play in the East. With three months, we should be able to do the whole country. Canada is a big deal for me, too. I have to play a few more shows in Canada than a lot of people do, because I, I actually, that's the one place I ever played arenas was Canada. I, I played hockey rinks there in the 80s. So All right. It's one of those, one of those I think Canada, the Canadians like songs. They always have. Singer songwriters do well there. I think it's kind of always been there. And so you got a, you got a record that's come out or good, 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 working on another record? What's going on with that? It came out in July. It's, it's called Electro Melodier. And it's, you know, it's something that we put together during the pandemic, you know, so we were able to kind of focus on it more than normal because usually we're, just kind of fitting it in, fitting recording in, in between gigs, but this time, you know, no gigs. So I think it has a different, different flavor, different elements, just being able to concentrate on the recording. Yeah. So uh, looking forward to, you know, getting out and playing more shows in 2022. And I guess, uh, you know, maybe, uh, Maybe you and I will meet up in Europe in 2022, Steve. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And we should try to get we should try to get together and do something on purpose at some point. We should share harmonicas, you know, you know, the whole nine yards. <laughs> yeah, share harmonicas and not it's one of those. <laughs> it's like, like I know that's a now that I think about that, that's like that's pretty fucking intimate when you get right down to it. Well, this is a it's been a blast. It's good to see you, man. Yeah. Likewise, been been good talking, catching up. It's a small world when you do this for a living. And I'm, you know, I just, it's one of those things, and not to hurt anybody else's feelings, just like when I spent about 30 seconds on the no depression thing, you know, on that message board until I figured out it was a waste <laughs> of time. And there were only about, you know, that there are about 300 nerds on there. And then, that, you know, damn, you actually went there. That's, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, I did. Go, I, I did go, but, but no, it, it, it would have been hard for you. Cause all I figured out all it was about was who's, you know, it was all like, uh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Postmortem stuff with your band, you know? So it was about, it was about who was cuter. And I always thought you were cuter anyway. So oh, it was one of those things. There were a question for me. I'll take that to the grave. I was an unapologetic. <laughs> Sunbolt guy, and I think everybody knows that. So it's good to see you, man. Thanks, Steve. Good talk to you. Good talking to you. See you. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Talk House podcast, and thanks to Jay Farrar and Steve Earle for chatting. If you liked what you heard, please follow Talk House on all your favorite podcasting services and social media channels. This week's episode was produced by Melissa Kaplan, and the Talk House theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time. <laughs>